structure sign in play is a critique of structurality. It's not just a critique of structuralism. It's a, street, it's, a, it's a critique of the idea of anything that has a center which is at the same time an enabling causal principle. In other words, I look at a structure and I say it has a center. What do I mean by a center? I mean a blanket term, a guiding concept, a transcendental signified, something that explains the nature of the structure. And something also, as Derrida says, which allows for free play within the structure, but at the same time, you know, the structure has this kind of boundary nature. I mean, it may be amoeboid, but it still has boundaries, right? And so at the same time, uh, limits the free play within the structure. And that's like the new critics saying that a text has structure. It has something that actually in the phenomenological tradition is called an intentional structure. You know, what well, Kant calls it purposiveness. That is to say, the way in which the thing is organized uh, according to some sort of guiding pattern. But to speak of an intentional structure as a center is not at all the same thing as to speak of an intending person or author or being or idea that brought it into existence. Because that's extraneous. That's something prior. That's genesis. That's a cause. Right? The intending author, in other words, is outside, whereas we can argue that the intentional structure is inside. But that's a problem. I mean, how do you get from uh, an intending author to an intentional structure and back? A center is both a center and not a center, as Derrida maddening, maddeningly tells us. It is uh, both that which organizes a structure and that which isn't really qualified to organize anything because it's not in the structure, it's outside the structure. And something that imposes itself from without, like a cookie cutter, on the structure. And so this then is, the, is, 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 the, is an introductory moment uh, in Derrida's thinking about centers. He talks about the history of metaphysics as a history of successive appeals to a center. That is to say, to, a, to a, some idea from which everything derives, some genesis or other that can be understood as responsible for everything that there is. And the list is very cunningly put together. This is bottom of the left-hand column. It's not necessarily chronological, uh, but at the same time, it gives you a sense of successive metaphysical philosophers thinking about first causes, origins, about that which determines, about whatever it is that determines everything else. And I'll just take up the, uh, the uh, list uh, toward the end. Transcendentality, conscience, consciousness or conscience, God, man, and so forth. Notice, how, th notice that although the list isn't strictly chronological, man nevertheless, nevertheless does succeed God. In other words, he's thinking about the development of Western culture. In the Middle Ages and to some extent in the early modern period, we live in a theocentric world. Man is, uh, understands himself, insofar as he understands himself as man at all, man understands himself as a product of divine creativity, as something derived from God, as one entity among all other entities uh, uh, who participate in and benefit from the divine presence. But then, of course, the rise of enlightenment is also the rise of anthropocentrism. And by the time enlightenment is in full cry, you get everybody from Blake to Marx to Nietzsche saying not that God invented man, but that man invented God. Man has become the transcendental signified. Everything derives now in this historical moment from human consciousness. Uh, and all concepts of whatever kind can be understood uh, in that light. But then, of course, he says, having said man, <laughs> he says, and so forth. In other words, something, something comes after man. 
<laughs> Man is, in other words, an historical moment. There are lots of people who have pointed out to us that um, before a certain period there was no such thing as man, and in, in, in a variety of quite real senses, after a certain moment in the history of culture, there's also no such thing as man. Uh, and the argument Derrida is making about, his, about the emergence of his event is that a transcendental signified has actually substituted itself for man. In other words, the world is no longer anthropocentric, it's linguistic. Obviously, the event that Derrida is talking about, the emergence, the rupture, an event which makes a difference is the emergence of language. The moment of emergence, the event, in other words, about halfway down, was that in which language invaded the universal problematic. In other words, that moment in which language displaced the previous transcendental signified, which was man. That in which, in the absence of a center or origin, everything became discourse, provided we can agree on this word. That is to say, when everything became a system where the central signified, the original or transcendental signified, is never absolutely present outside a system of differences. He's making a claim for language while erasing it. In other words, he's, he's painfully aware that language is just the new god, the new man. That, and, and many critiques of deconstruction take the form of saying uh, that, that deconstruction simply in instrumentalizes language, gives it agency, gives it consciousness as though it were god or man, and then pretends that it isn't. This is a, this is a common response to deconstruction. Derrida is aware of it in advance. He says, look, I know we're running this risk in saying everything is language, or if you will here, everything is discourse. But at the same time, we are saying something different. Because hitherto, we had this problem of this. In other words, we had the problem of something being part of a structure, that is to say, God is imminent in all things. You know, human consciousness pervades everything that it encounters. In other words, something which is part of a structure, but which is at the same time outside of it. God creates the world and then, sort of as Milton says, himself uncircumscribed withdraws, right? God is not there. God is the Dieu caché. God is the hidden God uh, who's absent from the world uh, is in effect the structure of the world. Same thing can be said of man. You know, man brings the sense of what the world is into being and then stands aside and somehow sort of takes it in uh, through uh, an aesthetic register or in some other remote way. Language doesn't do that. Language is perpetually immersed in itself. Derrida is claiming that language is different in the sense that it makes no sense to talk about it as standing outside of what's going on. And this is an essential part of the critique of structuralism. Language is not other than speech. It is perpetually manifest in speech. It, 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 it's, it's, it's simply a distinction that can't be maintained, which is why he calls it an event. In other words, something of significance has happened, Mr. Jones, and that is language. 